For me, it's evening. It's the uh, 27th of September, 2022. And I have been listening to some conversations about the uh, current running Amazon Prime television series, Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power. And I haven't watched anything other than short excerpts, trailers, but I've seen a lot of conversation about this show, uh, pro and con. And uh, I'm gonna reserve my judgment uh, for the moment because I wanna talk about Bombadil. Now, a lot of the conversation about Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, uh, that, that I've been looking at that comes to me through my YouTube feed, uh, has to do with Tom Bombadil. Who is he? Um, how do we explain him? Will he be a character in Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power? And I don't have the answer. I'm not particularly concerned to speculate on it, uh, but it did bring to mind the character of Bombadil, who has always been one of my favorites, and I'm actually grateful that he didn't make an appearance in the Peter Jackson uh, franchise of The Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit, uh, which he might very well have done, and probably... Uh, there'd be a lot of disappointed people. But Bombadil is a significant character in, uh, in The Lord of the Rings as, as we have it in, as a finished work by the author. Um, and it seems that he had some significance to the development of what we now have as The Lord of the Rings. Um, Elsewhere, I have uh, done some analysis of the poem, The Adventures of Tom Bombadil, also of the poem, Bombadil Goes Boating. Um, and uh, they're, they're quite interesting works um, for slightly different reasons. Uh, but I want to look here at, uh, at a sort of textual analysis of the Lord of the Rings um, and the place of Bombadil in the Lord of the Rings, but also the place of Bombadil in the broader world of the Legendarium. So I'm going to read a series of passages that have to do with Bombadil and that also have to do with the character Gandalf. And so um, uh, part of the question about Bombadil or discussion about Bombadil is what is Bombadil? And I'm going to attempt to make some response to that. I think it's a fairly standard response, but I haven't seen anybody who has done quite some of the things that I'm going to do. So I've got what what I I I don't know that it's really a breaking scoop, but I just haven't heard anybody um, put things together the way that I'm going to do in the course of the rest of this video, if everything goes as planned. So, in the chapter, In the House of Tom Bombadil, which I cite rather than a page number because there were so many different editions, so many different printings of The Lord of the Rings. Uh, but in the chapter, In the House of Tom Bombadil, we read the following. Whether the morning and evening of one day, 
or of many days had passed. Frodo could not tell. He did not feel either hungry or tired, only filled with wonder. The stars shone through the window, and the silence of the heavens seemed to be round him. He spoke at last out of his wonder and a sudden fear of that silence. Who are you, master? he asked. Hey, what? said Tom, sitting up and his eyes glinting in the gloom. Don't you know my name yet? That's the only answer. Tell me, who are you, alone, yourself, and nameless? But you are young, and I am old. Eldest, that's what I am. Mark my words, my friends. Tom was here before the river and the trees. Tom remembers the first raindrop and the first acorn. He made paths before the big people and saw the little people arriving. He was here before the kings and the graves and the barrow whites. When the elves passed westward, Tom was here already, before the seas were bent. He knew the dark under the trees when it was fearless, before the dark lord came from outside. I'm just going to read these passages and then come back to them for some analysis. Well, the tale is now told from first to last. Here we all are, and here is the ring. But we have not yet come any nearer to our purpose. What shall we do with it? Oh, this is from the chapter, The Council of Elrond, and it's Gandalf speaking. I'm not doing a Gandalf voice. Sorry. There was silence. At last, Elrond spoke again. This is grievous news concerning Saruman, he said, for we trusted him, and he is deep in all our counsels. It is perilous to study too deeply the arts of the enemy for good or for ill. But such falls and betrayals, alas, have happened before. Of the tales that we have heard this day, the tale of Frodo was most strange to me. I have known few hobbits, save Bilbo here, and it seems to me that he is perhaps not so alone and singular as I had thought him. The world has changed much since I last was on the westward roads. The Barrow Whites we know by many names, and of the old forest many tales have been told. All that now remains is but an outlier of its northern march. Time was when a squirrel could go from tree to tree, from what is now the Shire to Dunland, west of Isengard. In those lands I journeyed once, and many things wild and strange I knew. But I had forgotten Bombadil, if indeed this is still the same that walked the woods and hills long ago and even then was older than the old. That was not then his name. Yarwen Benadar, we called him, oldest and fatherless. But many another name he has since been given by other folk, Fawn by the dwarves, Orald by northern men, and other names beside. He is a strange creature, but maybe I should have summoned him to our council. He would not have come, said Gandalf. Could we not still send messages to him and obtain his help? asked Aristor. It seems that he has a power even over the ring. No, I should not put it so, said Gandalf. Say rather that the ring has no power over him. He is his own master. 
but he cannot alter the ring itself nor break its power over others. And now he is withdrawn into a little land within bounds that he has set, though none can see them, waiting perhaps for a change of days, and he will not step beyond them. But within those bounds, nothing seems to dismay him, said Aristor. Would he not take the ring and keep it there forever harmless? No, said Gandalf, not willingly. He might do so if all the free folk of the world begged him, but he would not understand the need. And if he were given the ring, he would soon forget it, or most likely throw it away. Such things have no hold on his mind. He would be a most unsafe guardian, and that alone is answer enough. But in any case, said Glorfindel, to send the ring to him would only postpone the day of evil. He is far away. We could not now take it back to him, unguessed, unmarked by any spy. And even if we could, soon or late, the Lord of the Rings would learn of its hiding place and would bend all his will toward it. Could that power be defied by Bombadil alone? I think not. I think that in the end, if all else is conquered, Bombadil will fall, last as he was first, and then night will come. I know little of Yarmen, save the name, said Galdor. But Glorfindel, I think, is right. Power to defy our enemy is not in him, unless such power is in the earth itself. And yet we see that Sauron can torture and destroy the very hills. What power still remains lies with us, here in Imladris, or with Cirdan at the Havens, or in Lorien. But have they the strength? Have we here the strength to withstand the enemy, the coming of Sauron. At the last, when all else is overthrown, In the chapter of the window on the west, in which Frodo and Sam, traveling with Gollum Smeagol, uh, are detained by rangers of Ethelion, uh, led by Faramir. Faramir has a lengthy um, diatribe in which he discourses on the history of Numenor, the history of Gondor, and various matter that other authors might very well have just not included or put into an appendix, but we do get some sense of the character of Faramir and also some backstory that is significant at a, a perfectly fine moment in the story for it to be presented to us. But I can well see how some people would be sort of chafing to read this uh, section of Faramir. Uh, it has basically been chopped out of the movie so uh, movie watchers don't get the, well, but so is Bombadil. So uh, some of these things are just as well to have been extracted. But uh, I, I did say that I would hold off on the analysis. So here is uh, the section that I want to use from the window on the west. This is Faramir speaking. But I stray. We in the house of Denethor know much ancient lore by long tradition, and there are, moreover, in our treasuries many things preserved, books and tablets, 
writ on withered parchments, yea, and on stone, and on leaves of silver and of gold, in divers characters. Some none can now read, and for the rest, few ever unlock them. I can read a little in them, for I have had teaching. It was these records that brought the grey pilgrim to us. I first saw him when I was a child, and he had been twice or thrice since then. The grey pilgrim, said Frodo, had he a name? Mithrandir, we called him in elf fashion, said Faramir, and he was content. Many are my names in many countries, he said. Mithrandir, among the elves, Tharkun, to the dwarves, Olorin, I was in my youth in the west that is forgotten, in the south, in Chanus, in the north, Gandalf. To the east I go not. And we could possibly consider some other passages, but I will conclude with this one, which is virtually the conclusion of The Lord of the Rings. At the uh, within the last six uh, paragraphs of the end of the chapter, the Grey Havens, we read the following. And the ship went out into the high sea. and passed on into the west. Until at last, on a night of rain, Frodo smelled a sweet fragrance on the air and heard the sound of sing singing that came over the water. And then it seemed to him that as in his dream in the house of Bombadil, the gray rain curtain turned all to silver glass and was rolled back, and he beheld white shores, and beyond them a far green country under a swift sunrise. <laughs> now, this, of course, was imported to and given Gandalf as a speech in the movies of The Lord of the Rings, where he is describing the passage of a dead person to whatever happens after death. And um this therefore and 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 maybe even without that plant in the movie um people tended have have often built this kind of assumption that frodo and bilbo are dying and that's why they're going to the undying lands cuz they are dead or they are dying, or... Which I think is an interesting interpretation because it's almost certainly wrong. They are going to the undying lands and they have not yet died. They are going to the undying lands because they withstood the uh, the temptations and the horrors that they did, and they're going with people who have a a right, so to speak, to be there, and they have been elevated to that same status as essentially 
very few others have. So barren in terms of people who were subject to the gift of Aru, um, which is death, uh, Baron, Arendel, Frodo, and Bilbo. That's it. Uh, to, to the best of my knowledge, within the legendarium, that's, that's it. So, um, in a sense, you could say Luthien, but she's kind of a different case. So, um, and, and Elrond is, is a kind of a, uh, uh, but he chose to be part of the elder race. So, uh, it, it is his right to remain alive in the undying lands. Um, uh, but we have this elevation to that immortal status, um, of a, a, quite a short list of, of heroes. Um, it begs questions about Gollum, you know, whether, whether he could have, uh, achieved it if, if he hadn't been, uh, burned up in the cracks of doom. <clears throat> anyway, those are the, those are the readings. And from those readings, I want to abstract a couple basic messages. One is, that Bombadil is eldest and nameless, oldest and fatherless, <coughs> and not nameless, but he's got this list of names and no one knows <coughs> what his character really is. In the Council of Elrond, there seems to be general agreement that, um, that he's always been there and he, he himself says, you know, Tom was here before the elves came out of the West, or came into the West, rather. <coughs> so, 